Morning, or evening, Grace, brethren, and sisters. Great to have all of you back along with us here uh, with our uh, Word Awakening Sunday a.m. sermon. It's great to, uh, to be back with you here. Of course, we didn't have uh, too, much of a, uh, too much of a layoff. We just had our revival this week, which uh, was together last Friday. Now back together, of course, here this morning. Amen. Still continuing the preaching and, uh, and of course, continuing through the Psalms. But certainly still hope everybody has a heart for revival. It's really what this you know, ministry is all about, reviving people. You see that with our name, Word Awakening. Of course, you know, being awakened by the Word of God, as we said through uh, last week's revival, you know, preaching the Word of God always accompanies revival, of course, reforming our ways <clears throat> to the Word of God always accompanies revival, and uh, so we look forward to continuing here with a Word Awakening and an hour of walk with God, amen, and I hope everybody personally is also uh, looking forward to that, getting closer and closer to the Lord, and just maximizing, my heart was on that this morning, you know, maximize the Word of God, and let's maximize, you know, our relationship with God, you know, and be maximized in our use for the Lord, amen, giving the Lord everything, uh, that uh, we do have. And uh, just continuing our prayer request here, uh, my mother-in-law, as of right now, is still scheduled to have that uh, procedure done on the 29th, which is Tuesday. That might be delayed for uh, for, for a couple of reasons, uh, but as of right now, it's still on. We'll find out Monday whether uh, uh, whether or not it uh, for certain is. But uh, so uh, I'll, I'll keep praying for her, though. Anyway, she does have a heart valve that's still leaking. If she doesn't have that Tuesday, uh, then she will eventually have that in, uh, you know, week, two weeks or so. And also my wife, who, like I said, has been having some, like, pain in her head. She's now starting to having, having some uh, kidney pain. So remember my wife, Jennifer Cooper, as well, as you uh, as you pray, let's do pray uh, one for another, uh, that God be with each and every one of us. And also remember our brother, uh, Tony Ramey, who listens to us sometimes on here, a preacher friend of mine back in South Carolina. Uh, he's been having some uh, pain in his arm and uh, some other places. And so let's remember him as well. Let's remember all those that are sick in body, <clears throat> all those that stand in need spiritually, financially, uh, whatever the need might be. Amen. And let's uh, do pray one for another. And we'll go ahead and uh, have a word of prayer. Our Father, we sure do love you. Uh, we thank you for the forgiveness of sin. Thank you for all that you've done. All the mean blessings that you've bestowed upon our hearts and upon our lives. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you just continue to be with us. And uh, do that mighty work in us, mighty work through us, Lord. We pray uh, just to give us that which we need, Father, Lord, to do your work and to do your will. And uh, help us all to be faithful. And thank you so much for our salvation and the meeting we had this past week. And I just pray that revival would continue. I certainly got help throughout of it, Lord. And I just pray other folks would as well. Well, Lord, that we would have one of those Acts 19, 19 revivals, a real revival where we get rid of our worldliness and all of our fleshly things. And I pray that uh, people just uh, be used of thee and that we'd all just continue to walk in your will and way, Lord, and stay in that spirit of prayer, stay in the word of God, and just live our lives wholly according to you, Lord, and what you'd have us to do, Lord. And uh, just to be with all the needs among us, my mother-in-law with her procedure, my wife, that you just touch her and Brother Tony Ramey as well, and each one out there that stands in need physically, financially, emotionally, whatever the need might be, that you'd be with us and just help us and then just use us for your own and glory, Lord, for and cross blessing. And we pray all these things. Amen. And amen. And uh, so uh, uh, just uh, uh, by way of announcement, uh, of course, we'll just get back to our uh, regular schedule here. Uh, we will be uh, Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, uh, like we'll be having our Bible memory verse again, as well as our uh, continuing in the Word Bible Institute, continuing there with the uh, starting the book of 1 Samuel, uh, continuing to go through Old Testament survey, and a fr Friday as well, uh, we will be having a, uh, of course, with our Friday uh, p.m. Uh, PM study, in which uh, we might have a special, I don't like to say might with things, you know, like me, I like to be sure, uh, but uh, we might do our Friday study, do a special one on the uh, on the uh, 31st on that Thursday uh, actually we're still just gonna leave it on Friday which is New Year's Day yeah because I kind of wanted maybe to do something on New Year's Eve to get people ready for the new year but we'll just do it on the first though that's the first day of the year and uh, we will have something uh, uh, we'll have a message that's kind of similar to what we did with this last week's revival uh, we're gonna kind of look at some uh, champions some champions like of the faith and I kind of look at there going into the new year about being a champion of the faith, amen, and kind of look back at the lifestyle. I kind of, we've done that before, but, you know, we'll do it again. It's kind of what this ministry here is all about. Uh, we'll certainly look at the Word of God as well as, you know, the lifestyle, <clears throat> you know, of great men that the Lord used to the Great Awakening revivals. 
And so we certainly do look forward to that. And uh, like we said there last Friday, like I know, well, like I said, I didn't plan to have any more revivals. I didn't even, I didn't plan to have another revival after the one we had in October, uh, the one that we had in the fall. Uh, but then, you know, the Lord just uh, laid on our hearts here uh, to have uh, this one the week of Christmas. And then, like I said, Friday night, if you, uh, if you, uh, if you watch the meeting, uh, like I said, that was going to be the last one. I wasn't going to have another one until, uh, until we moved to northern New York, uh, but uh, but the Lord told me, and he told me right when I said that, right after I said that, he was on my heart, he said, be careful, you might have another one again, and so we might have another spring revival, oh, which is fine if the Lord wants us to have one a season, you know, I, I see that very, very fitting, so we could have another one in March or April, because it'll probably be more, I will probably be more like around, uh, around uh like around june like whenever we uh whenever we do move probably be closer to the summertime and so we could have another meeting there like in march april or uh, may you know just as the lord leads uh that's what uh, that's what we will do amen and so uh just continue to pray for us that we walk in the lord's will and ways like i said i'm not a person that just does things to do it uh you know just have more followers or you know to put out more videos than anybody else does more preaching and teaching but you know it is a gift that god has given me like i always say, you know, the Lord's given, you know, called me to preach, and then also, you know, has given me a gift, you know, to teach the Word of God, to write, and everything, and so, uh, and so kind of along the lines of that, <clears throat> just to mention those, a couple of things, like, uh, we do send out a newsletter every week, if you'd like that, just send me an email, uh, that's all free, and so, uh, and so we thank the Lord for that. And then, like, also, like I said, we have a Bible Institute, you know, just for those that uh, might not be quite sure, just to remind some folks. That is all completely free, all tuition free. We don't have any registration fees, nothing like that. The only thing that people pay for is the is the cost of books. And, you know, and the books are very, very inexpensive, you know, just about every book, you know, that uh, that, that we use, you know. You know, none of them are going to be more than $20. If any of them are, there's only going to be a couple that would even be more than $20. They're all very, very cost effective. And so, uh... And so uh, we thank the Lord for that. Like also, I've wrote a few books. I have some of those published now. We're going to have a lot more that are going to be published. Of course, my, uh, that, that are going to be published soon uh, since our local library and all has been back open. I wrote a lot, you know, this uh, just this past year, uh, within the last year and a half. Like I wrote a lot. I've wrote quite a few things, more commentaries and like other books and all that are going to be published soon. And so, and like I said, all the books that, <clears throat> that I also have are very cost effective. I make no profit off of that whatsoever. The only, the only thing people pay for for is the uh, cost of printing and so uh so if that can be a help and a blessing to you in any way and th those are also available in, in ebooks like on the book patch the book uh, like i'll put a link to that here on the uh as well like on the sermon it's been a little while since i've done that and so, like, the commentaries that I've wrote on the minor profits are just all, you know, like, two, three dollars a piece. Then also, you can buy those as well, like, in an ebook format. If uh, you go there as well to download, like, on a tablet or a computer or smartphone or whatever. And so, if any of those things can be a help and a blessing to you, like I said, come on, you know, and be with us. Of course, like I said, with our Bible Institute, you know, everybody, anybody and everybody, you know, can view those videos on here and should, you know, be a student of the Bible. Like, even if you don't want to enroll, you know, don't want to enroll, you know, officially, like, formally as a student. Uh <clears throat> Well, that's certainly to be helping a blessing to you coming from the Word of God. And so continuing on here in the uh, in the 22nd Psalm, in the 22nd Psalm, of course, just want to say we do appreciate everybody's prayers and uh, what everybody's done for us, uh, done for us here and all the support that we get uh, through this ministry. Uh, like some things, you know, that I have, uh, that I have, uh, you know, taught over here the last couple of years, kind of rough, you know, like we've looked at, uh, uh, you know, like looked at things like television, you know, the one-eyed God, like we did a study there uh, a couple Fridays ago, it was about ditch the man cave bring back the study you know just really challenging people uh you know not to have you know uh not to have idolatry in our life like with sports and things of that nature you know we even put out a video you know suggesting people you know how to uh how, with help help to watch television you know putting that suggestion out there um you know not to be a holier than now but you know like i said it's all about revival you know we're gonna look more about that friday uh, you know, like about the lifestyle of revivalists, you know, they were people that were just all, you know, for the Lord. And unfortunately, you know, here in the 21st century, you know, you know we just got a lot of dead churches, you know, let's just be honest about it. 
Uh, you know, even independent fundamental Baptist churches, uh, you know, the average member is not a student of the Bible. You know, they don't spend a lot of time in prayer. You know, we've got people who love sports and, you know, conservative talk radio and movies and, you know, things of the world, you know, but not a lot of people that just really have an honest heart for revival and that's what's needed. Amen. And so continuing here uh, through the uh, through the book of uh, through the book of Psalms, but we'll also look at a little bit here, of course, on the 22nd Psalm. Continuing here, we're going to finish up the book here. I uh, hear this. Uh, I uh, hear this uh, morning. Shouldn't be a very long message though. Like verses twenty-seven and thirty-one, uh, particularly toward the end of it, like all going together. We'll just kind of read those verses and make a little comment at the end, and then uh, that'll be the uh, then that'll be the end of the twenty-second psalm, and we get into the very popular twenty-third psalm. Amen. So I look forward to that. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> So begin reading here. We'll read verses uh, 23 to 26. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him, all ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him, and fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised, nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. And so uh, continuing our uh, our message here, the prayer of the righteous. Our Lord, we pray you'd add your blessing to the reading of your word and help us as we try to preach. Give us that which we need, Lord. Uh, do that uh, mighty work in us, mighty work through us, Lord God. May Christ be honored and exalted through our hearts and through our lives and through all that we do. I pray that we'd stay in the spirit of prayer and that we'd be used mightily, mightily of thee, Lord God. Lord, just take and be with us, Father, like only you can. And I thank you so much for your grace and mercy and what you've done for us this year. I know it's been a trying year, uh, but you know, looking back, We've consecrated our lives unto you, and uh, you've just uh, you've helped us and you've blessed us. And I just pray that spirit of revival would just run through us mightily, and that we would just uh, be what we ought to be, Lord, to build your kingdom and preach us this morning. Help us that which we need. Remove every demon, every stumbling block, every demon of hell, each and everything that stands in our way, Lord. For it's a cross blessing, and we do pray. Amen. And amen. And so number seven here, our seventh point is affectionate praise. He says, There ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him. And so here we have the uh, psalmist who is uh, who is praising God. Of course, as we've said, this is a messianic psalm. Uh, the, these are th all of these things here are applicable to the to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Some of them also, uh, you know, were you know were also like uh, things that happened in the life of David. Uh, but all of this is a messianic psalm, and it is all applicable like to the Lord Jesus Christ, of course. And uh, and you know he's praising the Lord, of course. You know he was uh, he was resurrected, and uh, you know the Lord, the God, the Father was with him. Him, even though he did give his life on the cross. But some things here that we pull out of, you know, this text, of course, we can pull, you know, we can pull, you know, all things out of text, you know, usually for our, uh, you know, for our edification and for our benefit, you know, and we should be praising the Lord in that same facet. You know, we should be doing these things here, uh, you know, that, uh, that the word of God says. You know, we certainly are to praise the Lord. You know, we are to walk close to God and give our life, you know, and be wholly consecrated unto God. You know, that that's the Lord's will. You know, like I said, I know some of the things, uh, like this past year, some of the things that we preach and teach and all with this ministry is, uh, is challenging. Uh, it can be challenging, but I promise you, not, not one person that, that has ever done, that has ever made these type of sacrifices has ever regretted it. You know, I've never met anybody that consecrated their life that regretted it. You know, you look at those great revivalists, you know, how they wholly consecrated their lives to God. You know, there wasn't a one of them, uh, you know, that ever, ever regretted, uh, you know, doing that. You know, you know, they enjoyed it. You know, like I said, like we're going to look at here, you know, there's fullness of joy, you know, whenever we just give our lives, you know, to the Lord, you know, and either, even other Christians, you know, they got things in that got things right in their life you know they got biblical convictions uh you know you know people they got rid of the television you know just you know just all together you know they just completely gave you know their life to god and lived you know a holy life you know nobody you know nobody has ever regretted it before you know it's really been the other way <clears throat> It's been the other way. Like I was talking to a preacher, a preacher that I know pretty well, not a pastor, but but a, but a preacher though that has a ministry uh, here a couple of years ago. Like I was talking to him, and he used to go to a you know to a much more conservative church, you know, a much more conservative church. Like he was still in an independent Baptist church, but you know, just being honest, he was in one of those independent Baptist churches that had looser standards, uh, you know, where people love sports, you know, and movies and everything else. But he used to go to a you know to a much stronger church. 
church, you know, that was just, you know, very, you know, that was just openly, uh, you know, and strongly, you know, like against Hollywood, you know, and things, a church that had much higher standards, you know, and then he started going to, uh, he started going, he, he had to leave the area, he had to leave the area, you know, for some personal reasons because of like, because of hurricanes and uh, so forth. And, uh, and he moved, and he moved to another area and started going to that, to this other, you know, independent Baptist church, except a church that was King James only independent Baptist, but, you know, much looser in standards. And I could just tell by talking, you know, to him, you know, how he was, he was the other way, you know, he regretted, uh, you know, you know, he regretted, you know, not, not really being a part of a church, you know, that had those strong, you know, standards before. Now that's how it is, you know, whenever we go that other way. Uh, you know what uh, people regret it, you know, whenever they leave, you know, churches that really have the power of God. <clears throat> and so we see here in verse number 23, ye that fear the Lord, praise him and fear him. The last phrase there and fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. So a letter A under here about affectionate praise. This is those who fear the Lord. Those who fear the Lord are going to be the ones that really, really do praise God with their lives. You know, people that really live in the fear of God. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse number 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. See, the real godly fear of the Lord is not being afraid of God, that God is going to chastise me if I do something wrong. Like we're going to look more like at the book of Deuteronomy that says a lot about that. The real fear of the Lord is just loving God so much that I don't want to let him down. You know, it's just like, uh, say like if you take a, uh, like if you take a, like if you take a little girl, say that has a piano recital. And her mom has helped her, her parents have helped her, uh, you know, and they're proud of her and everything. And she goes, you know, to that first recital and uh, she wants to do well. You know, she doesn't want to mess up. She doesn't want to mess up because she's uh, uh because she's scared of that, that her parents are going to be, you know, mad at her, that her parents are going to spank her or punish her or whatever. She doesn't do well. She, she, she has a, she has a reverential type fear. She wants to do well because she doesn't want to let her parents down. She wants her parents to be proud of her. See, that's what the real fear of the Lord is. You know, we don't want to let God down. You know, we want to live holy, consecrated lives. Because we don't want to let the Lord down. That's what the real fear of the Lord is. I want God to be pleased with me. And see, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. See, the beginning of knowledge. You know, you want to have godly, you want to have godly knowledge. You've got to have the fear of the Lord. You know, you've really got to love him. You know, just like that little girl, you know, she loves her parents. She wants them to be proud of her. You know, do we really love God? Because I know there are a lot of people that use that loosely, but their life doesn't say it. Now, I really love God. Well, what do you do for God? How much time do you spend with God? Do you have godly knowledge? You know, it's just like we said, you know, having that real godly knowledge, you know, just being honest, you know, that, that's a, you know, that, that's a foreign concept. You know, that is a foreign concept, you know, even to the average independent fundamental Baptist church in this day and time. You know, because people are not in the word of God. They're not in prayer. They don't have strong walks with God. You know, they love everything of the world, but not really the Lord. And see, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, having a godly knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Like I was listening to Brother David Cloud last night. You know, I like what he really said. You know, Christians, you know, should have a desire to learn. You know, especially in this day and time with all the resources that we have. You know, us as real believers, you know, we should love knowledge. You know, go godly knowledge, yes. But even, you know, just knowledge in general. You know, knowledge of wholesome things. But, you know, that, that's a foreign concept, I know, to, to, to most independent fundamental Baptists. You know, they have no desire to learn. You know, they just want to sit in front of the television and entertain themselves or whatever. But, you know, that there's no reason that we can't learn things in this day and time. You know, things that are, yes, you know, applicable to the Bible. You know, maybe things like, you know, Christian, uh, Christian si creation science. You know, like creation science. You know, real, you know, wholesome things. See, fools despise wisdom and instruction. That's what the Word of God says. You know, us as believers, you know, we should have a real desire to learn things. You know, a real desire to know more and more. You know, having that godly desire. See, and those who fear the Lord, you know, they will do that. And also like the other uh, book of Deuteronomy. 
Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy 5. Now, Deuteronomy 5, 29. Oh, that there was such an heart in them, see, having a heart for God, that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always that it might be well with them and with their children forever. See, have a heart. Have a heart for God. See, that's just like, you know, that little girl, you know, with that heart for her parents. She loves them so much. You know, we should be the same way. Have that heart for God and love him. Not wanting to let him down. But, see, they're keeping all his commandments. See, keeping all his commandments. See, never in the word of God does it endorse a 75% Christian, a half-hearted Christian. Never. You know, it's always all, everything. You know, keep all my commandments always that it might be well with them. See, and with their children forever. See, like we looked at that, you know, with the revival last week. You know, continuing on, you know, with the next generation. You know, that's something the Word of God is very big on. It's very, very big about continuing the faith. You know, because if one generation doesn't teach the next generation, what's going to happen? You know, what's happening now? You know, like I said to that revival, like all the time, I'm 34 years old. You know, and even here in the Bible Belt, you know, it's difficult to find people younger than <clears throat> younger than 50 years old. You know, you even younger than 50 years old, you know, who are in an independent Baptist church. You know, because there's been a lapse in the generation. You know, because the people didn't teach their children the word of God. You know, they neglected the power of God. You know, they were just half-hearted. It's half-hearted. It could be about everything. You know, that's why people of my generation, you know, even in the Bible Belt, you know, don't want to have anything to do with biblical Christianity. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 2. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes. See, there it is again. To keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son. See, that then thy son's sons, all the days of thy life, that thy days may be prolonged. We've got to fear the Lord and carry that on to the next generation. Deuteronomy 10, 12. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Well, see, people... Because, see, it's really kind of, you know, just common sense here with this issue of what the fear of the Lord is. Because people are not going to just do some things. People are not going to do everything that they should do if they just do it to stay out of trouble. See, like once again with children. You know, like a lot of children, you know, they just behave when? You know, when their parents are around. You know, whenever they're in their own bedroom or they're especially, you know, older, you know, whenever they get older, like older teenagers. You know, they're not doing always what their parents want them to do. You know, when they're not around their parents, you know, they just do right when they're around them. And see, that's just like with the fear of the Lord. If people just fear God because they don't want to be chastised, you know, then they're just going to do, they're going to, they're going to do as little as they can. They're not going to do all, like it says right there, they're not going to serve the Lord with all their heart. You know, they might go to church on Sunday morning and be a Christian around other believers, but, you know, when, whenever, whenever they're alone and nobody else is around, they're not going to have that type of fear of God. But see, that's a reverential godly fear. You know, fearing God, living with him with all our heart, because we do not want to let him down. Now, continuing on here in verse number 24. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither hath he hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he erred. Let her be here. God has always delivered. See, he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither hath he hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. See, we praise God because God has always delivered the real believer. He always has. He's always, always been there for us. Always has. And he always will. Be there for that believer that's living for him, that's serving him with all his heart. Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians. Before we actually use this text here back in the revival, but it's a good one and very applicable here. 
Verse 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. See, God is able to work things out for a person that lives by faith because God has power that men don't. Like we also looked at that within the revival, like living by faith. You know, living by real faith. You know, we, we've said that a, a, fair, a fair good amount, you know, here lately. Like, like externally, things that are not possible with man are possible with God. You know, oftentimes, like financial things, uh, you, know, you know, like financially, you know, things don't look like they're going to work out, you know, especially when you try to do something for God. Uh, you know, you move your family to start a church, to be a church planner or whatever. You know, th things don't look bright. But there's power in God that's not in us, and that's how God is always able, you know, to deliver his believers, you know, to change our circumstance. You know, to either change our circumstance or give us grace with whatever. And continuing on there, you know, in verse number 8, For we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. See, that's a godly peace. See, that's a peace that passes all understanding. See, somebody that walks close to God, they know that. They, under, they understand that. They know that God's going to deliver them. Like now me at 34 years old, I have no doubt that God's going to take care of me because I've seen him do it time and time again before. You know, he always has. There have been a number of situations where things looked really bleak for me, like they weren't going to look out. But God's grace was always sufficient, and God always delivered me, you know, just in time. And like we used Martha, you know, as one of our biographical sketches, like the brother, the sister of Lazarus. You know, like Jesus was four days late, but Lazarus was still late, was still raised. You know, oftentimes it looks like God is going to be late. <laughs> you know, but even whenever it appears, you know, that the Lord is late, <laughs> he's really not. You know, he's always right on time. Because, you know, that's a power that God has that we don't, we are perplexed, but not in despair persecuted but not forsaken you know they suffered real persecution in these times but you know god never forsook them you know even though they had to endure some physical pain like the apostle paul you know he was a man that did miss meals you know he was he was a man you know that was really really afflicted you know cast down but not destroyed you know the world is always going to reject biblical christians and we're always going to be cast down by the world, but we're not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. See, the Lord does allow these things to happen to just show us his glory, you know, to teach us things. And, you know, that's true with every great believer. Every great man of God, you know, went through a very difficult time. You know, that's purging. You know, every great Christian, you know, is going to go through a very, very difficult time before they can be used of God. Like that great preacher, A.W. Tozer, he used to say all the time, you know, there, there's not one, you know, there, there's not one Christian that God has used greatly that he did not first hurt greatly. But see, that's purging that's mentioned in John 15. But God is always there. See, that's what we find here in the book of 1 Peter and uh, chapter number, chapter number 4. 1 Peter, chapter number 4, verses 12 and 13. Beloved, think it not strange concerning... See, think it not strange. Don't think it strange. Don't think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. See, it's not strange. It seems strange, but it's not. See, every great believer, you know, has had that happen before whenever we go through that fiery trial. But rejoice! Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering. See, we're a part of the sufferings that Christ did. That when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. See, God just uses these things. See, just like, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, he was afflicted like nobody ever has been and ever will be. You know, he was completely, you know, humiliated, you know, by dying on the cross. And see, whenever we suffer, you know, we identify with him. You know, by living our faith, you know, if that's, you know, if that's just, you know, standing up for our biblical convictions, you know, and some people walking away from us, you know, some people, you know, just walking away from us, you know, because of, you know, because of our standards and what we stand for, or if, you know, it's because we step out on faith and, you know, people just don't understand, you know, what we're doing. The Lord's always there. Now, verse number 25, my praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. 
I will pay my vows before them that fear him. Of course, like vows, that was something that they did, uh, you know, in the Old Testament. Of course, that's not really something that, uh, of course, we do, I guess, you know, have our vows now. You know, we have our service to the Lord, which is this sub-point. But, you know, back then, uh, you know, like with their offerings, if they had a need or something, you know, they, they would make a vow to the Lord, like with their offerings, whenever they would present offerings. You know, like if a relative, you know, had some type of disease and they wanted that relative, you know, to be healed from it. Or if, you know, like a person, you know, had a personal, you know, financial need and they would make that offering and they would vow something to God. You know, say, Lord, you know, I'm going to do this or that, you know, if you heal this person or if you help me with this financially. You know, that they would come back and they would pay their vows, you know, that's mentioned in the book of Leviticus. But see, like with us here, you know, we, we do the same thing, though. You know, we give our service, you know, letter C. You know, we give our service. We do our service to God. Because, you know, just like the Lord has saved us, you know, we owe God our life now. You know, everything. Because our Christ, you know, fulfilled the law. You know, Christ fulfilled the law. So, you know, now, you know, you know, we have the ultimate sacrifice in the Lord Jesus Christ. So what are we supposed to give? Our lives. You know, that, that's, uh, you know, that's Romans 12, 1. You know, presenting your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service. You know, it's just our reasonable service now, you know, to give our whole life to God because Christ has fulfilled all the law. You know, we give everything, you know, everything that we have to God, you know, all of our finances, you know, all of our talents, you know, all of our being, everything, you know, belongs to God. Like we looked at there, you know, with that revival, everybody has their own path. No, you know, that doesn't mean that every Christian alive now is supposed to be in full-time Christian service. You know, was it like preaching or, you know, teaching at a Christian school, a Bible college, or something of that nature. But, you know, all of our life, you know, belongs to God. You know, all of our life is supposed to be consecrated, you know, to God. See, we do our service. Verse number 26, the meek shall eat and be satisfied, like meat there, that's talking about the poor. The meek shall eat and be satisfied, they shall praise the Lord, that seek him, your heart shall live forever. And see, letter D, we are satisfied with the Lord. See, like, are you really satisfied with God? See, people that really fear the Lord, like we mentioned there, people that really fear God, they're satisfied with God. See, like people, you know, who make those sacrifices, who say, I'm not going to fool with watching, you know, with watching sitcoms on television. I'm not going to concern myself with sports. You know, I'm not going to have to spend a multitude of time out of my day, you know, entertaining myself. I know we're all just humans. You know, we're not robots. God didn't make us that way. You know, like we all need a break. You know, we need rest and relaxation. You know, but people who are going to do like what the revivalists did. You know, and just give, try to give every waking moment that they can to God. That's people who are satisfied with God. You know, that, that's people that don't need the things of the world to satisfy them. You know, that's what fasting is. You know, that's denying our flesh, you know, to be filled with the Spirit. You know, and even in our daily life, you know, we deny our flesh to be filled with the Spirit. You know, rather than turning a television on when somebody picks up a Bible and they study it. Or, you know, rather than, you know, watching the ball game or whatever and spending that time praying, you know, that's people who are satisfied with God or were really satisfied with God. Like we looked at at that revival, you know, last week I said that. I remember back like when I was a, a young teenage preacher, about the time, around the time I guess I surrendered to preach. So that would have been, you know, like about, you know, like, uh, like close to 20 years ago or so. You know, like I heard somebody make the, uh, make the comment. Talking about the tithe, you know, we give God 10% of our income. What if we gave God 10% of our time? You know, and myself and other people that were around when they thought of that, you know, that actually sounded challenging. And I said, me, I did at the time as well. I was only 15 years old. You know, that was the time when I was still big in sports and, you know, even into video games, you know, and movies and things before I made, uh, you know, some sacrifices my own self. But, you know, that sounded relatively challenging, you know, 10% of our time. You know, but now 34 years old now, I'm just being honest with you, like with this ministry of Word Awakening, what God's called me to do, 10% will sound like much of nothing. Don't sound like much of nothing. 
They'll see somebody that's satisfied with God, they'll give God a lot more than just 10% of their time. So are we satisfied with God? You know, are you really? First Chronicles 29.9. Then the people rejoiced for that they offered willingly. See, they're like, like we were just talking about. They offered willingly, not, not, not scared that somebody's going to chastise them. They offered willingly because, why? Because with perfect heart, they offered willingly to, to the Lord. Of course, once again, that doesn't mean sinless perfection there, that those people are just sinlessly perfect. That means mature. You know, that, that's people who are spiritually mature with God. And David the king also rejoiced with great joy. See, that's real joy there when people just have a whole heart for God. People that are willingly, willingly offering their time. Willingly offering all that they have to God. Giving God everything that they have. Ezra chapter number 6. Of course, we go here to the to the post-exilic times of Israel. Whenever they came back to Jerusalem, Ezra 6:16. 6, and the children of Israel, the priests and the Levites, and the rest of the children of the captivity kept the dedication of this house with God with joy. Because, you know, in a lot of ways, that's kind of like what we are here, you know, in the 21st century. You know, especially myself with my ministry. That's that's what I really see myself, you know, rebuilding the temple. You know, that's why I love this time so much, like Ezra, Haggai, and Zechariah, and all. Because that's really, you know, in a, in a lot of ways, it just, you know, feels like that's what we're doing. You know, we're rebuilding the kingdom of God, because we've had such a great falling away. See, they kept the dedication of the house of God with joy. So are we doing it with joy? Are we rebuilding the kingdom of God with joy? Because, you know, what, what, is, what is this thing? Well, what did they need in the times of Ezra and Haggai? They needed people doing that. They needed people that were wholly dedicated to rebuilding the temple, to rebuilding, to rebuilding the things of God. What do we need in this day and time? More sports fans? Uh, you know, you know, somebody else, you know, you know, we're in love with Hollywood? No, 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 by the stretch of any imagination. We need sold out believers. You know, we need people, we need people who are just sold out completely to God. Verse 22. And kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy. For the Lord had made them joyful. And turned the heart of the king of Assyria unto them to strengthen their hands in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. See, God will give you more strength. I know that might sound like a challenge. I did with me, you know, even, even an individual that was raised in a fundamental Baptist church. You know, some of these things at one time, like I said, you know, that sounded challenging to me at one time to just give God 10% of my time. But see there, it strengthened their hands. Whenever they kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they kept it with joy. The Lord made them joyful. Why didn't he strengthen them? See, he turned the heart of the king of Assyria unto them because, you know, previously the king of Assyria was against the people of God. But he turned things around for them, and he strengthened their hands in the work of the house of God. See, God will strengthen you. Might sound like a tall task, you know, to do something like to quit watching sports or to say, hey, I'm just not going to concern myself with the things of this world. You know, I'm not going to concern myself with entertainment. And I'm just going to give my heart and life to God. God will strengthen you and help you with it. Now, actually, just going back here a few chapters from where we are in Psalm 22, this was a text that we also used there in the revival. Psalm 16, 11, Thou wilt shew me the path of life. See, somebody that's on the path that they ought to be on living for God. And thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures, there are pleasures forevermore. So look at that fullness of joy. See, that's a term we find often in the Word of God. You know, that's a term people use relatively often. Yes, I love God. I have fullness of joy in the Lord. Well, do you really? See, that right there, that, that's really being satisfied with God. You know, are we really that way this, this, this morning? Do we really have fullness of joy? 
Because if somebody has fullness of joy, they don't need the things of the world. Somebody that's got fullness of joy in the Lord, you know, that they're, that they're not going to be mad all, all week long because, because their ball team lost. They're not going to be mad all week long because they missed that TV show. They're not going to have to rotate their schedule around something on television or around some type of form of entertainment whenever you got fullness of joy. Can we honestly say that we have fullness of joy here this morning? And then lastly, here we'll be through in uh, number eight, announces the conversion of the nations. Of course, that's one thing that Jesus Christ did here. You know, through the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, the gospel that went to both Jews and Gentiles. In verse number 27, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before the Lord. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. Of course, that wasn't, you know, just Israel anymore. If that went out to the Gentiles, like we looked at last Friday night of the revival, like we looked at Cornelius, you know, whenever the gospel first went to Gentiles. All they that be fat upon earth, fat there, that meaning like prosperous and wealthy people, all they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship. See, even prosperous people, even prosperous wealthy Gentiles are going to worship the Lord. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him, it shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. See, once again, talking about the generations there, that means the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's going to be passed down from generation to generation, as it has. You know, at times that has been a small minority. But it's still going to happen, though. See, that's why it's so important to teach that next generation. So that can continue. You know, even though it might be a small minority, there's still a group of people, you know, they kept the faith alive, you know, even through post-exilic times. You know, even though that, that was only, like, if you look at the numbers, that was only a small minority that went back to Jerusalem. Because, you know, like Esther, you know, and those people, a great majority of Jews, you know, they stayed in Persia. They didn't even go back to Jerusalem. Even though that was a small minority, you know, it was a small minority that kept the faith alive. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this. See, declare the righteousness of God unto a people that shall be born. See, we must keep declaring, keep declaring the things of God. Amen. Keep spreading the gospel to the world. To those who need it. Well, who needs it? Everybody. Everybody needs it. Amen. Of course, if that's, you know, just lost people, like communities, like, like with my ministry, if that's church planning. Obviously, to communities that need a Bible preaching church, and to other believers, Amen. You know, like a lot of stuff that uh, that we preach and teach on here is, you know, it's it's geared toward believers, because you know, believers they need to get a hold of these things. They really need to get a hold of the power of God. They need to get a hold of what it really is to be a biblical Christian. You know, like we said there, you know, that's just that's my heart. You know, that that's my heart, and I believe that to be true. You know, like even with independent fundamental Baptist churches, you know, like we said at that revival, yeah, I use the King James Bible, you know, we got those people. You know, I'm you know, King James only, pre-trib, pre-millennial, you know, biblical dispensations, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I got, got, a, got a nice doctrinal statement, but, you know, just being honest, you know, we've got a lot of people, yeah, that use a King James Bible, but they live an NIV life. You know, things that we preached here, you know, having the fullness of joy of God, giving ourselves wholly to the Lord. You know, that's just not something that a lot of people live. And we need people that live it, amen? So let's do this, that. Let's live it. Let's get a hold of it and live a really, truly righteous life. Oh, we need another revival, folks. I just, no question, you know, no question at all about it. What does, uh, what does our society need? You know, a revival. You know, a revival among all else. You know, we need people to get revived and get excited about the things of God and really live for Him. And so thank you, folks, for uh, for being with us here uh, this morning. And so I got to finish up uh, Psalm 22. Great psalm there, Messianic psalm. So much great things we can get from the Word of God there. Of course, starting next Sunday, get into Psalm 23. Certainly look forward to that. Uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps the most popular chapter in the Bible. And uh, so that'll certainly be a help and a blessing to everybody. So let's pray for these folk. Excuse me. Let's pray for these people that stand in, stand in need. Be praying for one, pray, be praying for one another. You know the devil don't like this type of preaching. You know he don't like these type of statements. The devil don't like anybody getting excited. You know and on fire for God. 
You know, and that's why we have so many distractions. You know, that's of the devil. The devil is doing everything that he can to distract the Lord's people from being what they ought to be for the Lord. So we got to pray for one another, amen, that will keep these things and be faithful. And uh, so we'll close in prayer. Our Father, we sure do love you. We thank you for the ends of sin. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for uh, for those that do love you, for those that stand with you. And I pray that we just continue to stand and, uh, and to walk with you and to be holy, to be separated, be wholly consecrated unto God and uh, to do that work, Lord, that we're called to do. Like I says there in Romans 12, 1, you know, we quoted it. You know, giving ourselves a living sacrifice, and that's only our reasonable service to you, Lord God. And I pray that we would do that, that we would be wholly consecrated and give you all our heart, all our life, with all of our being, and that we would be faithful and do that work which we ought to do, Lord God, and just give us that which we need, Lord. And we'll be careful for you then all the praise and all the glory of God because you love it, Lord, and bring us back the next point in time. Bless our dear listeners, we pray. Amen. And amen. So, folks, we'll see you tonight, preaching in voice and in sign language in the book of Mark. And until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, I am Brother Cooper, and I love you, and I appreciate you.